Okay, so our next talk is um, by Julien and uh, Vinit here, and uh, it's about uh, securing um, hyperthreading. So Vinit and Julien are kernel and performance engineers at DigitalOcean. Their current mission is keeping up with security vulnerabilities while achieving the best possible performance out of their servers. For that matter, their talk today is about the development of core scheduling feature, and um, uh, and they try to leverage that feature to allow hyperthreading to be secure. All right, and with this, I'll pass it on to Julien. Thanks. So, hello everyone. Thank you for being here today. So, today we are going to talk about core scheduling, and it's a feature that has been uh, on the work for about a year on the LKML, and it was uh, the, the goal is to really make the use of hyperthread secure in regards to the various security vulnerabilities we are seeing. So today we are going to show you why we need th th this feature, what is actually this feature, and what were the roadblocks and problems we encountered during the, the past year, uh, and how we tested, and what are the next steps. So a lot of people have interacted on the, the mailing list, it's not just us, it's a community effort, so, and people are in the room as well. So <laughs> if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt, and I'm sure you will get answers. So in the past years, we have seen uh, an increase in side channel attacks. And it's, uh, so we have seen meltdown. We have seen Spectre V1, Spectre V2, L1 TF, MDS. Most of those have been fixed in the kernel or in uh, microcode updates. But some of those uh, vulnerabilities still have issues with uh, hyperthreading and SMT in general. So. For L1 TF and MDS in particular, we are there are no mitigation that are SMT safe. So the fact that we have shared resources increases the uh, attack vector. And the only safe situation currently is that we need to disable hyperthreading to be safe. Um, hyperthreading is a performance uh, feature. Uh, we have uh, some use cases where we see uh, noticeable drop in performance when we disable hyperthreading. So that's why we are really interested to see if we are able to make sure that non-trusting threads never get to share the resources exposed by SMT. And that's the core scheduling feature. So now we need to go more into details to in the feature. Thanks, Julian. Um, so yeah, as he explained, um, disabling SMT is is the safest way to go, and we the co by core scheduling we are trying to make sure that um, we are trying to achieve a state where we can keep uh, SMT on and then trying to make it more secure. So uh, these are the details. Uh, these are the bullet points, main main bullet points uh, regarding core scheduling, where you need to have a core wide knowledge when you try to schedule onto the siblings, and. Uh, only trusted processes should be able to execute at the same time on a core. And if they, if, if you cannot find a match, if there are no two trusted processes on the core, then one of the sibling has to go idle. It has to be forced idle. And uh, load balancing is another thing where um, if you if you cannot find a trusted process to run on the on, on one sibling, then probably take it from somewhere else so that you 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 don't you don't waste the performance. So um, there are two cases here. I tried to explain it pictorially. So in this specific case, you have uh, a matching uh, scenario. So those are the two run, run queues of which uh, it's ordered in the uh, order of priority. So like task C is the most uh, highest priority on run queue one, and uh, task O is the highest priority on run queue two. So um, and uh, that that's a grouping. Like group C is a group of trusted processes. Same same wise, group X is a set of uh, trusted processes. And if task C is higher priority than task O, it would schedule task C and N, which is on the same group. But if task O is the highest priority of the whole core, then task O selects task A, and that those two get to schedule on the core. On the second case, if there is no task match, uh, for example, on run queue two, if task C is the highest priority on the core, but it doesn't have a match on run queue two, then you basically force idle on CPU two. But uh, the other case, if task O is the highest priority one, which is ungrouped, you have a match, which is task A, 
and you you get to schedule task O and task A on 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 the two on the two siblings. Now coming to the history, uh, the very first implementation was very virtual machine specific. It was it was specific for KVM, like the trust boundary was uh, that the trust. Uh, boundary was like only vCPU threads could be on the same VM could be trusted. So when a vCPU thread becomes runnable, and if there is no vCPU thread from the same VM on the other sibling, you basically force it idle. And uh, then came the generic core scheduling iteration, where instead of instead of be, instead of the trust boundary be virtual virtual uh, CPU threads, you have processes uh, grouped as a trusted boundary. So you can group uh, a list of processes to be on a, on a single trusted group and then make it co-schedulable. Um, how to group this, but the initial prototype uses C CPU C groups because it was quick and easy to prototype. Um, going a bit detail in the KVM based approach, um, as I mentioned before, we have vCPU threads uh, that's of the same VM as trusted bound, uh, as a trusted group. And uh, since you need to have a core-wide uh, knowledge uh, about about the about the uh, group, you basically use a sked domain shared structure to have the uh, core-wide information. And when a vCPU thread is runnable, uh, you IPI the sibling, and the sibling comes into schedule, and then it tries to find a match uh, of the same uh, vCPU thread from the same VM. And if you cannot find a match, it basically uh, schedules idle. And the matching logic also took care of the other synchronization points. Like, if if a thread does a VM exit, uh, then then the sibling pauses, or if an interrupt happens, the sibling pauses. Similarly, on the schedule also, you have the synchronization point. Um, this is about the generic approach. Instead of the vCPU threads, you have processes at the boundary, and you. Uh, the idea is more or less a sim a similar, but instead of vCPU threads, now we have a set of processes, and the idea of matching logic is also a little bit different. Here, what happens is, uh, schedule on a sibling takes care of uh, picking a process for the uh, sib other sibling as well. So instead of sending an API directly, uh, the schedule on one sibling picks a process for the other sibling and then lets it know, okay, you ha I have already picked one for you, you just need to execute it. And if a match cannot be found, it basically forces idle. Uh, these are the details, how we do that. So the policy, how you group is based used, uh, using the CPU C groups, and there is a new file, cpu.tag. If you set it to one, all the processes in that CPU gru C group comes under one group, and it's, it's identified by a cookie, which is a 64-bit value. Um, and uh, Every run queue actually maintains an RB tree to search the uh, tagged processes. So when when a sibling sees that it, a tagged process is going to be scheduled, it uses this RB tree to search on the other sibling uh, to find a match. And if there is no match, it it forces idle. There uh, up till there have been three iterations. Um, V three is the one that we are discussing on the list now. V2 was mainly about fixing build and stability issues, and V3 was about fixing the core uh, logics bug that we had in V2. These are the issues that we find now. So uh, since now we have a core-wide core knowledge about uh, scheduling, so we need to compare the priorities of processes in multiple CPUs in the same core. And for that, uh, for the fair cut class, we use the VRUN time as, uh, as to compare the priorities. But V runtime is not really designed for comparing the pro priority across the C across the CPUs, so that has been a main issue. And V1 was blindly comparing V runtime, um, and that had starvation issues. Uh, I'll be discussing more about that in, uh, in the later slides. Second thing is uh, about force idle. So you force idle a CPU to make the other sibling run securely, but the forced idle CPU, um, like it takes a long time to come back online. Uh, to, to schedule a new 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 thread, so that has been one issue, and another issue, strange issue that we were seeing is difference in performance when we when we do uh, tagging. So you have process A and B. So if you tag process A and untag process B, you see a difference. If you untag process A and tag process B, the performance is yet different. And if you have two different tags, the performance is again different. So we had performance issues with uh, the way we tag. 
Um, this is one of the, this is the first fix that we came up with uh, regarding the VRUN time issue. So since VRUN time issue cannot be compared, we use the same logic that current scheduler uses for migrating a process to a different run queue. So it's 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 like you decrement the min VRUN time from uh, from the source run queue and increment it with the uh, destination run queue. And it did help, it, it, uh, uh, it fixed a couple of starvation issues, but still it was not perfect. So this is one of the corner cases uh, where we were seeing starvation issues with uh, the normalized V runtime. So it's, it's, it's a bit uh, intense, I'll try to explain. So you s say you have two siblings, CPU1 and CPU2, and CPU2 has only one task, task B, CPU1 was idle. At a, at a later point of time, task A is enqueued. Um, then the matching logic speaks task A, but it's incompatible with task B, so CPU 2 is forced idle. And then again, one more schedule event comes. Um, you do the normalization, uh, but before normalization, since task A is the only task running on CPU, the run queue's min V runtime and task A's runtime is equal. It's progressing together, and it, there's only one task. So, uh, similarly, on uh, CPU2, it's idle, it's not progressing, so the min V runtime of the run queue and the task B's runtime is same. So now we start the normalization. From the B's V runtime, we decrement run queue's min V runtime. Both are same, so it becomes zero. Then we add RQ1's min V runtime. So now task uh, A's runtime and B's normalized runtime is equal. So when when we compare and if both are equal, you select the first task. So task A is selected again, and CPU2 is forced idle again. This, this goes on until a, a new NQ or DQ happens. So uh, task B never gets a chance to execute, and we see this starvation issue. Now, regarding the forced idle, this is also some corner cases that we were seeing. So uh, consider the same case where you have two CPUs with only one task to run. Uh, and uh, task A, let it be a um, compute in an intensive task. So CPU 2 goes a force idle, and CPU 1 is continuously executing the only task that it has. So um, CPU 1 will never get to schedule because it has only one task, and CPU 2 never gets to schedule because scheduler thinks that it's, it's idle. Even though it has been forced idle, scheduler thinks that it's idle, so CPU 2 never gets a chance to schedule and the CPU2 will be forced idle for a long time. These are the proposed solutions currently we are discussing in the mailing list. So for the forced idle issue, uh, the issue, the main issue is because the scheduler thinks that uh, it's idle, even though it has been forced idle. So if we can account the forced idle time using, using separate metrics and then specifically explicitly trigger scheduling, that would be the way to go. That, that's one discussion that we are happening. And the second idea is about uh, having a separate thread per uh, CPU to actually do the force idle. Instead of using scheduler's idle thread, uh, if you come up with a separate idle thread just to do the force idle, that way the scheduler will not be confused. And the third way is, uh, third discussion that we have is uh, use the idle thread itself, but have specific checks to distinguish between forced idle and the normal idle. That way, pro, uh, scheduler can be less confused about what's happening when you go idle. And for the V runtime comparison across CPU, um, one idea is like come up with a core core wide runtime instead of a CPU wide runtime. Uh, you will have a core wide runtime so that the comparison becomes straightforward. And another idea is like um, go to the parent, uh, come up with, come up to a level where you, your comparison makes sense. You can go to the root uh, and maybe compare two processes uh, runtime. That way it, it will be much more consistent. Now I hand it over to Julian to uh, discuss the testing and the benchmarking efforts that we have done. Thanks. So for testing this feature, we ended up having to use most of Linux tracers. <laughs> so the first uh, tracing we had to do was to make sure the core scheduling was actually doing what it was supposed to do. So making sure incompatible tasks were not running at the same time on the same core. So for that, we used perf and stng because we needed long running traces and being able to parse that in Python. So both of those tracers output CTF traces. So it was easy for us to uh, create 
So for this uh, specific case, we wanted to make sure no incompatible tasks are running at the same time. Another use case for that was uh, trying to identify when uh, tasks are not running when the whole core is idle. So that was one of the problems we found at the beginning. And so we needed, again, long traces for that. So that's why we used the, those ones. For debugging the actual logic of the core scheduling, we used ftrace because the code is instrumented with trace printy. So it's easy for us when we have specific places in the, the trace to look at actually what the core scheduling uh, logic is doing. And finally, for runtime statistics, we used eBPF and BPF trace to check at runtime how much time uh, running task is off CPU. That's usually a good metric when we are not overcommitted, just trying to see if there are some uh, efficiency issues uh, somewhere in the code before having to wait for the whole benchmark. So in terms of uh, output, this is one of the scripts we, we run that uh, can output the detail of the co-scheduling statistics. So we have how much time a specific process and all its threads currently we are tagging the full process. So all the threads of the same process are co-scheduled during the, the, the duration of the trace. How much time the same process uh, is co-scheduled with idle. So in, in this case, it's uh, close to 60% and how much time the process spent co-scheduled with uh, another process that is not in the same tag. So that's the, the, the area we have really to, to watch because we, are, we want to make sure that that's not happening. We have some overlap between the two processes, but it's mainly just when we send the API to the sibling to it to, to force uh, idle or just to switch the, the process. So there is, it's not 0% but it's inside the, the kernel during the IPI and scheduling code. And unknown is because at the beginning of the trace, we don't necessarily have the full detail of what is happening. And in terms of performance validation, we designed multiple micro benchmarks because for each cases, we had specific worst cases. So instead of having the full uh, workload running and then trying to figure out what was happening, we design a specific micro benchmark. So for example, one of them right now is the for the fairness issues. We have two incompatible CPU intensive tasks. Each of them is pinned on a different sibling of the same core. So what you expect with core scheduling is to have exactly 50% of the time each, uh, each, each task is, should be running 50% of the time. So, but right now we are seeing fairness issues and we clearly see cases where the one task gets to run much often, much more often than the other one. And we, are, we test that with no tagging, with tagging only one process, tagging the other one, and tagging the two with different tags. And uh, that's how we found the, the cases where the tag processes also get more chance to run. So that's the one of the current micro benchmark we are using. We are also trying with overcommitted cores to, to see how the load balancing is working. And, and we have uh, a couple of them like that. Uh, we also want to make sure we are on the right track and that we are eventually going to uh, be able to use that uh, on real workload and not just micro benchmarks. So we have also real world scenarios where we use large virtual machines running heavy uh, workloads like the micro ben uh, MySQL benchmark on 12 vCPUs or more VMs. We have IO intensive VMs, CPU intensive VMs, and we test them alone on the NUMA node uh, when shared uh, with the NUMA node and also with the noise VMs. So they are just mostly idle VM, but they still need CPU time, and then we can play with uh, over commit ratio and see how, how the core scheduling logic behaves. So this is one of the the early results we got, and that's probably the, the best case for uh, core scheduling is the CPU intensive VM. So in this case, we have three 12 vCPU VMs running Linpack, so really CPU intensive workload on a 36 logical CPU NUMA node. The VMs are floating on the node, but you can count it's 36 vCPUs on 36 logical CPUs. So 
if we disable SMT, that's where we take a uh, big hit, about 20% of uh, performance impact. Whereas if we use core scheduling, it's almost the same as the, the baseline number. So that's the, the best case, and that's why we're encouraged to continue working on core scheduling, because disabling SMT would be much easier, but uh, we see performance uh, gain, and that's our goal here. So that's the case where we use, if you use all the CPUs, then core scheduling makes a lot of sense. If you only use half of the CPUs, so that's uh, the case where no SMT would not be overcommitted. And we actually noticed in the, the mailing list that uh, it's actually a performance improvement to disable hyper-trading, even compared to baseline. So because we end up having less uh, cache crashing and each thread actually has its own L1 cache and we realized that the scheduler could be made SMT aware and be more uh, aware to place tasks more adequately, but that's a sidetrack. <laughs> it's not the, the focus of, of this, uh, but it was interesting. In terms of I.O., again, it's really about CPU power. So in terms of I.O., no major difference between no SMT and core scheduling. If we have mixed resources, so like the MySQL benchmark I was discussing before, then it becomes interesting because in this case, it's a heavy workload. We have two 12 vCPUs, MySQL benchmark running. It's only the MySQL server. The client is hosted on a separate host. So we have network, we have disk IO, and we have CPU uh, workload uh, work. And on the same uh, Numa node, we are also uh, with 92 one vCPU idle VMs. So all of that is running on 36 logical CPUs. That's a case where no SMT actually performs better than core scheduling. And our idea currently is that it's related to what we were discussing before, that the CPU intensive tasks from the MySQL benchmark are actually preventing the IO uh, threads to, to be able to perform. So that's why we are working on that. It's not the final result, it's what the current state. So the, a good rule of thumb, if, if you have uh, about more than 40% uh, CPU idle time, then no SMT might be a good choice, but if you have less than that, then core scheduling makes sense, basically, we are disabling CPUs. <laughs> so after V3, when we fix the, the fairness issues, we still have a lot of work to do to consider uh, proposing for mainlining. So the one of them is the process selection and matching logic between the classes. Right now it's only per class, but we would need to be more flexible about that. Um, the big one right now is the for NDS specifically, because that's a vulnerability where we would need more synchroni synchronization points. We have right now with core scheduling, we are protecting user space from user space, but we are not protecting user space uh, kernel from the user space. So a malicious user space application could benefit from NDS to, to attack the, the host kernel. So if we want to fix that, we have to add synchronization point on system calls, interrupts, and also VM exit. And that might be very costly. So that's the, the current discussion right now. For L1TF and VM on only workload, we can get away with just having VM exit, but uh, for an NDS on bare metal application, then uh, it needs more synchronization point, and that may be a no-go. We have to really look at that. Uh, last thing is also defining the right interface. We have uh, currently we are using C group to to tag the processes, but we may need uh, another interface. But that's also in discussion currently. So that's it for the talk. We have plenty of time for our questions. And also know that we have a micro conference this afternoon to discuss more in details what are the next steps. So thank you. Um, does it work for so also for RT priority? Uh, tasks or only solely normal? 
because uh, there are use cases uh, where we set RT priority for virtual machines uh, threads, right? Yeah, yeah, it does currently. So um, the match, the the schedule fu schedule actually goes through all the classes, uh, starting from the highest priority to the lowest priority, but it's not tuned for that. And Peter uh, has some patches uh, ready for that. So there is there is another talk regarding that. Yeah. So yeah, there there are efforts going on for RT as well. So continuing on the real time topic, there are some uh, some information that you have <coughs> using the buffer scheduled deadline on and on the fixed priority scheduler that are global depending on the number of CPUs. Like the admission test on scheduled deadline, we use the number of CPUs to determine it. And uh, we have the runtime share, RT runtime share on the real time scheduler, the 501. Have you guys have a look on it? Uh, how are decisions made or are these still open problem? Um. As of now, we th there was no changes. This particularly this core scheduling patch set that we discussed currently did not have any changes specific to the uh, things that you mentioned. So what we do in that logic is uh, go from the highest priority class to the lowest priority class sched class and just pick the task. So so the pick task is implemented in the in the skets on uh, uh, class. Uh, functions so we have not modified that part of it so you just pick the highest priority task from using the pick task function and then compares it with the other 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 core so we did not make any changes inside the uh, real time uh, sket class yet yeah, uh, just last one uh, just curious if you also try to get uh, performance numbers on a kind of a mixed uh, thing where you I don't know try maybe to clusterize the groups so you want to be isolated on like uh, a partition of all the available CPUs and try to make everything else on uh, on the other partition and see if it works. Uh, we did C we did CPU pinning uh, and uh, like we did a couple of tests where we turned SMT off, got the got the numbers and pinned the pinned the individual processes to see how how it worked and then floated it on all the CPUs to see. So yeah, we did a couple of tests and uh, as it as you mentioned, like uh, the the if if it's really CPU intensive, mm -hmm. then we we get the benefit out of core scheduling. But if it's a mixed workload, yeah, probably you'd have more to add. Yeah, and also we have still a lot of tests to do. For example, also pinning I/O threads on sp specific CPUs uh, that's not done yet. Have you uh, spent any time thinking about systems with more than two HT threads that are core? The the code is actually generic, but we did not get the time to actually like we did not have a hardware to actually test it. As of now, it, there is there is no place where we hard code it to two, so the code is kind of very generic. We use the CPU mask to see uh, whether they are whe whether they are SMT of the same core. Mm. So, but we did not test it yet because we did not have hardware. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, currently, the interface is C group. So can you tell a bit more about the, uh, the new interface to uh, assign the core cookie? Um, like there has been no proposal yet. So we were trying to get the, get the core logic to work and uh, uh, fix all the bugs. But the discussions currently in the mailing list are about maybe use PRCTL or uh, to actually set the, set the task groups. So yeah, because CPU might CPU C groups might not work for every every use cases because it's 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 a it's a it's a privileged operation, and there are other other issues about that. But uh, it's not finalized, and discussions are going on. Okay, another question is: uh, There are several uh, patches posted to fix the fairness issue on the mailing list, so it's it's worth to pick up any to post the version four. Uh, can can you can you come again? Uh, I mean, uh, if you want to uh, pick any uh, patches to fix a uh, fairness issue to post a new version. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so as of now, I think a mix of everything works, but uh, there is no, everything has its own, its own um, like uh, uh, issues. So, but we, when we, when we uh, like take two ideas and try to club it together, it works better. So, so it's not yet decided like the V4, uh, it's, it's still in the discussions, but uh, 
but yeah, the, it's not yet decided which one to actually proceed. Okay. One more question. Uh, do you guys have plans to extend the mitigations kernel command line option to, to maybe enable core scheduling if your CPU is affected by NVS or LNTF and then maybe not enable core scheduling if, if you have a new enough processor not to be affected by those issues? Yeah, I think that that's that's that the way sense. that's the way to go. Actually, right. yeah. So uh, this feature might not the it doesn't make sense to enable this feature by default. Mm -hmm. So starting from the build process itself, uh, like we have, uh, uh, if uh, it, it's a config option. So starting from the build uh, procedure itself, we try to make sure that it doesn't interfere with the with the generic kernel. And uh, if it's built by default, then it should be enabled by a kernel mitigation option. Okay. And then then. Once once the system boots, you you will you will have to enable it by tagging. So if there is no tagged process on the system, uh, scheduler uh, no code path is involved at all. Okay. So yeah, there are multiple levels where we. And also to add to that, the administrator knows what are the s the groups, so we have to specify what are the trust groups. So that's why the core scheduling feature by default does nothing until tag okay. tasks are tagged. So how, how do you actually plan to attack the fact that even with the core scheduling patch that the kernel is still not protected? So wh what do you plan there? That's the, the place where we have to add synchronization points. So right now it's only at the sketch switch boundary, but we also need system calls and interrupts and VM exit. Which will probably then make the uh, comparison to no SMT look a little bit different. Yeah, right? that's yeah. The, what we are trying to, to look at. And that's why we added also that for uh, there are VM only workloads where you only run VMs and that make more sense to use for scheduling because you have only VM exit right. to take care of that. There's another proposal being discussed uh, this week that tries to address that without having to do it synchronously. I think the Argos guy is presenting it, but it, it, there's some tricks you can do with the, with extending KPTI so that you can do some kernel execution, but not all. Uh, hi, uh, so I have a question that uh, when we have a two cores and uh, one core has multiple untagged uh, tasks, another core has single tag tasks, then how the load balancer will behave in this case? Because uh, ideally we should not pull the task from that core, right? Uh, so the I busier core. Yeah, ideally you will not pull it from that that core, but but the idea of pulling is uh, you have a ta task pro process on one core, and uh, you are forcing the sibling to be idle. So instead of forcing the sibling to be idle, if you have a task uh, tagged process on the other core, just pull it once, and then then uh, this core would be balanced from then on. Okay, but but. Uh, if you are not pulled the task, they might have run on the other core. No? Yeah, you will be only pulling tasks that's not running on not it. Running. So they are waiting. So if there are tasks waiting on it, so if, if it's already running, it doesn't make sense to pull it from there. It's only pulling from the run queue. Okay, so this is just to balance uh, the utilization on each core. Exactly, and to make sure that yeah, uh, to make sure that you are you making use of the SMT and uh, enforcing security. And what happens if the uh, two processes which we are trying to load balance are uh, have set pinning to specific uh, CPUs? Yeah, we, we will not touch those pinned tasks. So so it still um, abides by all the rules of pinning and uh, uh, isolation and ta and task groups etc. So only only tasks that could be moved are moved. Yeah, because a uh, lot of the exploits are uh, exploiting exactly that and they're pinning to the same CPU as the process they're trying to exploit. So you force idle on it. So you cannot, uh, migration will not work, but you still enforce one sibling to go idle. Thereby the other, other sibling executes in, in isolation and, and secure. So the performance will be low, but uh, security is enforced. With this tag task, how do you ensure that the system is balanced when the load balance is running 
I mean, the statistic is done across all the tasks, all the thread. How do you m make sure that the system stay balanced? So there are two levels of uh, idle balance happening. One is the system's own idle balance. And this, lo this load balance that we mentioned here kicks in only if it sees that a thread has been forced idle for long. So a, uh, in a core, if one of the CPU has been forced idle, and uh, then to it will go from the lowest cut domain to the topmost cut domain to see if there is a ta tagged task matching the sibling's task, then it pulls it over. So it doesn't interfere with the idle balance, the system's own idle balance. I, it only kicks in synchronously when, when you see that it has been forced idle. And for the busy load balance mechanism, I mean, when, when all the CPU are used, you still have to balance to make sure that you will not provide more runtime to one task or one group of, of tasks compared to the other one. But if the system is busy and if there is a ta tagged task waiting on another CPU, it makes sense to move it to here. Yeah. And the system's own idle balancer might pull tasks from here which are waiting back to the other tasks. So, so yeah, I see it as two different things. Um, probably, uh, we haven't tested it deep enough to see if there has been bottlenecks, but yeah, I now I get your point. I, there, there can be issues where system might be continuously load balancing due to two yes. different, yeah, you're right. Kind of counter that point, have you looked at um, when you have a task doing wake balancing to put it on a forced idle CPU of a, like a core that matches its tag? We, um, most of, yeah, that, that's another possible issue. A new NQ might happen to a forced idle CPU because the scheduler thinks that it's idle. Um, we haven't seen that in practice because mo most of our test cases were, were like uh, uh, micro benchmarks which, which uh, calculated number of processes. But when you scale up to a b bigger production case, we might see that, yeah, that's another thing that we need to look into. That's true. Thank you.